Good evening and welcome to Metro Focus. I'm Jenna Flanagan. Tens of thousands of people and hundreds of thousands nationwide marched through Manhattan this weekend in a show of solidarity, a demonstration of democracy, and a call for new gun laws. The rally coincided with the March for Our Lives in Washington, D.C., and was one of hundreds of protests to be held worldwide after 17 people, predominantly students, were gunned down at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. The message sent undoubtedly powerful, but the question remains, what next? Will this lead to meaningful gun reform? And will this new movement have implications on the midterm elections in November? The nationwide marches wasn't the only significant story to develop over the weekend. Stormy Daniels' highly anticipated interview finally aired on 60 Minutes, where she told Anderson Cooper that she was threatened to keep quiet about an alleged sexual encounter with President Trump in 2006. According to the adult film actress, the stranger told her to leave Trump alone before looking at her young daughter and stating that it'd be a shame if something happened to her mom. A lot to digest, and for that, I'm pleased to welcome political analyst and author Ellis Hennigan to the program. Ellis, as always, welcome back. Hey, great to see you, Jen. So there's so many topics to discuss, but of course, everyone at the water cooler is talking about Stormy Daniels. <laughs> so let's start there. Okay. What was your take on the interview? Well, it was moving. Anytime the headline says the president and the porn star, the president is going to be on defense. So uh, as long as people are talking about this, it's not good for Donald Trump. All right. But then the president isn't necessarily on defense. I mean, he usually is pretty quick to tweet about stuff he doesn't like. We haven't heard anything. No, he has been oddly silent on this one. And frankly, we do not yet have a coherent version of these events from the president's point of view. I mean, mm -hmm. Did he know her? Did he sleep with her? Did he pay her off? How much of it did he know about? Uh, we know Stormy's story now. We know her lawyer's story, but we still don't really know Donald Trump's story. All right. But is the official line still, as far as we all know, deny, deny, deny? Well, yes. They've been sort of vague denies. The fake news uh, was trotted out again in the hours after the interview. But um, as far as a point by point uh, uh, contradiction to this, no, we haven't gotten that yet. Okay, so if we can divorce ourselves from the salaciousness of this uh, aspect of don't, the story. Don't even try that, by the way. <laughs> but there's also the legal implications, yes. because this does bring up some serious campaign finance issues. Uh, that's right. There are limits on how much money someone can give even a so-called in-kind contribution to a presidential campaign. And the $130,000 that the president's personal attorney uh, said that he paid out of the goodness of his heart and his own uh, home equity credit uh, exceeds the limit by somewhere around $127,000. Okay, so is there still something then to look into? Does this story still have legs? Well, complaints have already been made about it to the FEC and to uh, to others uh, as well. I, you know, that's a long and slow process. So while that uh, rolls through the regulatory process, yeah, people will keep talking about it. Uh, Stormy's lawyer, give him credit. He's done a really good job of keeping this thing drip, drip, drip alive and I suspect it's got a few more days in it yeah oh I'm sure there's several more days it'll be a stormer summer uh, for 2018 yeah. but moving on I do also want to talk about the other really important thing that happened this weekend and that was all of the marches across the nation yeah. the more more important maybe. yeah much more important so first off what kind of impact do you think having these numbers of people in the street might have on politicians. Well, I can give you 10 rational arguments as to why a horrific mass shooting does not tend to have much actual legislative and political impact. I mean, history certainly teaches us that, right? Well, I think a lot of us want to know why right. that isn't the We've case. We've been through so many of these in the past. But, you know, politics isn't always rational. And I got to tell you, this one is feeling to me like a cultural moment where uh, both the way uh, uh, folks at large as well as our political representatives are responding to this thing. And, and these, kids have, these kids have sparked something that is real. What is it about these kids? Because we are talking about mostly high schoolers. I think mm -hmm. we're calling them Generation Z right now. Okay, but, we're going to run out of letters uh, exactly. pretty soon. Um, yeah. But anyway... A lot of these kids aren't even eligible to vote yet. So a lot of them will be turning 18 as we get close to the midterms. But what is it about these kids that have, seems to have put the fear of God into some politicians that we haven't seen before? Well, they have a very clear, a very simple, and a very emotionally appealing message. Do not kill my friends. I mean, that's pretty hard to, to argue against. Now, I know you can go out on Twitter and on the net and, and find examples of people mm -hmm. sliming these kids and, and blaming George Soros for the demonstrations and, uh, and casting all sorts of uh, aspersions. But 
you know what? It's pretty hard to look at someone who has just uh, lost a friend like that. Uh, I love Emma Gonzalez, by the way, the young woman who held that crowd in Washington for nearly six minutes of silence. Yeah, That's that was tough, very powerful. Tough and powerful, and, and like I say, a, a very clear message. Uh, one last question on this subject. Do you think there is a chance, because we've seen before where NRA supporters have been single-issue voters. Do you think that this movement could create single-issue voters in 2018? You know, you're putting your finger right on the key question. Uh, yes, it's always been true that people who want to protect Second Amendment rights have been uh, much more motivated than those uh, uh, looking for sensible controls. But the emotion on the issue is beginning to shift. I think some politicians, uh, look at the governor of Florida, Governor Scott, who's a long-term uh, opponent of gun control, kind of coming around. Now, this was his state, but a lot of more uh, activity, I think, maybe in the state houses. That might be the first step down the road to some, uh, to some actual legislation here. All right. Well, Ellis, very quickly, because we have a limited amount of time left, but um, your take on the 60 Russians who have been expelled. This is kind of surprising from this administration. Uh, yes, maybe the very first a negative comment about uh, the Putin government uh, out of the Trump administration. 60 uh, diplomats uh, evicted. Uh, now, when you say diplomats, really spies here under diplomatic cover. Our European allies are doing it really pretty much across the continent. And um, the Russian government, uh, you know, uh, taking notice. Well, this is definitely something that we'll be watching as it develops. And of course, Ellis, we'd love to have you come back and talk to us a little bit more about Russians being kicked out of, <laughs> out of the U.S. And of course, what we can expect to see in these important upcoming midterm elections. Yeah, yeah, jam-packed news, right? Exactly. Thank you so much. Good to see you.